All right, good morning, church. It is time to begin Bible study this Sunday morning, July the 5th. Hope life is treating you well and you had a great holiday weekend. We're going to be diving into Acts chapter 12 this morning, so get your Bibles ready. Let's start it off with prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving and giving to us in every way. You are so good in everything. Lord, your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, so we don't always understand, Lord, what you're doing or how you're doing it or why you're doing it or allowing it. But Lord, we do trust you because we know your word says that you do all things well and that all things work together for good for those that love you. And so Father, help us this morning to grasp this Bible study, Lord. Help us to not just hear it, Lord, but take it to heart. May it penetrate deep within us, Father. May it stir something long dead. Lord, re restirring the embers, and then, Lord, may it bring forth holiness and godliness, Father, to a world that desperately, desperately needs Jesus. Thank you, Father, for giving us the privilege of being your children. I open our hearts and our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are looking this morning. I'm sorry about last week. My computer was uh, fried, and I was supposed to have it back, and uh, just didn't work out that way, and so um, I tried a couple of different options, and that didn't work out either, so we just took it as the will of God, so um, it didn't work, And but we're back on this week, and we're glad to see you this morning. Um, if you'll take a look with me, last week we uh, began talking about the church at Antioch, and that's where they were first called Christians. They were called followers of the way. Um, before that, and they began to be called Christians uh, in Antioch. Um, and Antioch was a, was a base for the church, a base for Paul and his missionary journeys. It was a, a great church in the midst of the most corrupt city in the Roman Empire by Rome standards, not by ours, but by Rome standards. Um, this, this city was the, the um, Sodom and Gomorrah or the Las Vegas of Rome, and so you know how um, how low the morals were in Rome to begin with. So this one, this city was the worst in Rome. So wow, so it kind of tells you. And it's interesting to me that the uh, the most thriving church um, was in that city. God God's ways are higher than our ways, and and He knows what's best. And so anyway, we are entering into a time. Remember, our study is on mission, you and I being on mission for the Lord and what that looks like, what that ought to be, uh, what we can expect, what we have no right at all to expect. And and uh, and we've gone through some pretty hairy things. If you'll remember, we went through a time where we were looking at Paul's life, but we were also looking at Peter's life. And Paul was uh, trying, people were trying to murder him <laughs> and he was having to run. Peter's life was, oh, everybody loved him, and, and he was healing and, and all these kind of things. And so we don't always understand, and that's why it's terribly important that you never compare yourself or your circumstances to someone else because you don't know what God's doing in their life, and you don't know what God really is doing in your life. You're just a part of it. And and so you just have to trust God by faith. The just shall live by faith is is a theme throughout the, the Word of God. And so you have to live by faith faith. When we get to chapter 12, um, we begin to turn a page and, and uh, we're introduced to Herod Agrippa, King Herod Agrippa. Um, and so he's kind of taken the place of Paul uh, in his persecution of the church. And so uh, verse 1, chapter 12 of the book of Acts. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. So this is not French people. These are just people who are actually a part, an active part of the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, so James and John, killed with the sword. And that's, that's sort of anticlimactic. Um, you know, it's just like, oh, and by the way, he had James killed with the sword. So um, you're thinking, well, if God is great, well, I guess the better word is since God is great, how could he let this happen? Well, we don't know. We absolutely don't have any idea why God allowed this to happen. All I can tell you is all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. And so for whatever reason, in James's life and in the life of the church and in the life of, of the gospel going forward, 
this was necessary. And so, um, so just keep that in mind, but we're going to keep reading. When Herod saw how much it pleased the Jews, in other words, man, they were happy to get rid of James. And when Herod saw that, remember his chief purpose uh, for allowing to stay in that position is that, because this is a Roman province, this is not, he's king, but he's only a vassal king. And so, uh, so being in a Roman province means that as long as he keeps folks down and he keeps the money rolling in or whatever goods that comes from that area that Rome depends on, as long as he does what makes Rome happy, he gets to stay as king. But that's the only reason he's king. The people didn't make him that way, although they learned to follow him. Uh, Rome put him in power, and he is a very, very powerful man. Obviously, he can have someone killed. And so this man saw that everybody was excited, or most people, the Jews, were excited about James being killed, and so he also arrests Peter. Now, there's a secondary note here. It took place during the Passover celebration, which tells you that, that, that uh, King Herod Agrippa has no... Um, um, thoughts about Passover whatsoever, and that the Jews didn't really mind that this all happened during Passover. Um, so this sh shows you how, hypo uh, how hypocritical they were concerning their religion. But anyway, he had him arrested. He imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Wow. I mean, he ain't kidding about this. Peter, while James is very powerful, James was one of the inner circle, and James um, was very close to Jesus. He, he really isn't in the world's eyes, Peter. And so he arrests Peter. And, and so he's going to make sure because to arrest him and not do something with him is going to have the opposite effect on King Herod Agrippa. Uh, and he knows that if he, if he doesn't kill Peter, um, torture him and kill him, then the people who were cheering him a little while ago are going to start trouble. The last thing Agrippa wants is trouble. That's why he had Peter arrested to begin with. And so uh, he imprisons him, placed him under the guards. He intended to bring out uh, to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. So didn't bother, didn't mind uh, arresting him during Passover. But we're not going to have the trial until afterwards. And he wants it very public. He wants it very. Hey, look what I'm doing for you guys. Look how great I am, and I'm taking care of all your problems. And, and that's the way he wants to be viewed. And in truth, that is the way he is viewed. And while Peter was in prison, the church, and notice what they did. They prayed. But they didn't do a microwave prayer. Oh, by the way, God, take care of Peter. Or, oh, wow, I forgot to pray about Peter today. They prayed very earnestly. In other words, it was top of their mind. They prayed hard. Now, you know, the argument can be made that maybe if they had prayed for James, he wouldn't have been killed. But the Bible doesn't say that, and the Bible's not an eight ball. You can't just assume anything, and you can't just ask it a question, shake it up, and see what it says. You can only ask it the questions and answers, and it doesn't really give an answer for why James was killed and why they weren't given the opportunity to, um, to see this. The only thing that makes any sense in my mind is that um, a James got to go to heaven during this pandemic it's really become apparent to me more so about myself that we care more about keeping people alive than we do about their eternal souls and I, I someone brought this to my attention several years ago when we looked at our prayer list together and they said brother Rondo you pray more people out of heaven than you do into it and and what they were basically saying was we pray more for the sick than we do for the lost and in this pandemic, it has really become apparent to me that we have no trouble focusing on saving lives, but we have tremendous trouble in the church on saving souls. James went to heaven, and he had been a great follower of Jesus Christ, a great follower of God, and he went to heaven. Um, the, so, so end of story. You, you, you want to make more out of that, oh, poor James. Don't, don't pity James. Pity yourself. James is in heaven. James is with Jesus Christ face to face. Peter is more than one you ought to pity. He didn't get to go. But the church is praying for him. They're praying earnestly for him. They know what he means to them as a church. They can't possibly conceive that God has another plan outside of Peter. Um, Peter is just that central to them at this particular point. 
and so they pray earnestly for him. Verse 6, the night before Peter was placed um, on trial, he was asleep. So that, that one little line there, because let's think about this for a minute. You, you know what happened to James. You put yourself in Peter's place. You know what happened to James. You know that Herod's intent is a mock trial to embarrass you as much as he possibly can, to shame you as much as he possibly can. There's no justice going to be distributed here at all. And then he's going to have you killed because this makes the Jews happy. And, and you live under no delusion of that. Peter isn't stupid. He isn't naive. Um, but Peter is full of faith. And, and the Bible records, remember at this point, he has the Holy Spirit of God in him, not just Jesus with him. And so what it says is, is that Peter is asleep. And the night before his trial, Peter's asleep, able to rest. There's, there's a lesson there, church, for us during this pandemic time, as there is in every other time of our life. Death is never more than a second away from us, ever, in any of our lives. There is any number of things that can happen from physical health issues to accidents to, to whatever. But any number of things can happen, and it's only a second away. And, and we don't really realize that, and we don't focus on it until someone keeps pumping into our heads this nonsense. And, and we begin to believe that that takes precedent. Yes, take precautions. Yes, follow what the CDC says as closely as you can, as long as it doesn't um, go against uh, your constitutional rights. Follow what they say and, and be careful, but sleep. Don't worry. If you die, you die. You go to heaven, you're James. If you live, you get to serve on with the Lord. Either way, you're a winner. Isn't that exactly what Paul said? And so here... He is asleep, fastened to two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard outside the prison gate. So they, again, they are not letting Peter out of this place. Peter has no worries, not for his trial. No, he's going to die. He's asleep. Maybe he's dreaming about being home with the Lord. Uh, who, who knows? Verse 7, this is how, you remember I said death is only a second away, so so is deliverance. You never know what the next second is is going to bring, but you trust in the Lord. If it brings death, you're present with the Lord. If it brings deliverance, you're delivered by the Lord. Either way, God has you. We're so afraid of death, church. And we, we look at it as if it's a horrible thing, and yet the Bible doesn't teach that at all. Death is a release. Death is, is, is a, to get to be a home with the Lord. We get out of these old bodies that we've abused or neglected or a combination of both. Um, and we get to go home to be with the Lord forever. Death is an amazing thing, amazing gift. And so it was conquered by Jesus Christ. He owns it. And so praise God for it. But in this particular case, unlike James, where death came suddenly, in Peter's case, deliverance came suddenly. Suddenly, verse 7 says, there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. Well, that had to be disconcerting. The angel struck him on his side and awakened him. So the bright light came in the room. Peter is obviously a deep sleeper. Uh, because the angel has busted into the room, bright light everywhere, and he has to wake Peter up. So that tells me that Peter's not only asleep, but he's asleep. I mean, he's, he's not in that light sleep. What's, are they coming to get me? Are they coming to get me? But he's in that deep, restful sleep, just trusting in the Lord. And the angel tells Peter, stand up, Peter. Stand up, Peter. Uh, and, and the angel struck him on the side. Get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Who unlocked them? The guard didn't. Peter didn't. This deliverance was totally of the Lord. I, I just want you to understand that in our mission, we hold the opportunity for chains to drop off of ourselves. And now, now in Peter's case, his, his chains aren't self-inflicted. In other words, he didn't do anything uh, ungodly to warrant. He didn't chain himself up. These are unjust chains that God makes. But there's a principle here that even 
in the chains that we place on ourselves, they can suddenly come off if we trust the Lord. The Bible says the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, get dressed, put your sandals on, and now put on your coat and follow me. So the angel is telling, you know, I'm wondering if Stephen is in kind of a stupor going on here because the angel is kind of treating him like a child. Put your shoes on, get your <laughs> you got to get your coat because we're going outside. But Peter has no idea what God is doing here. God didn't come down and say, hey, Peter, I'm going to let you out. I'm going to send an angel, and you're going to need to get your clothes on. The, 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 the things are just going to drop right off of you. God didn't tell any of that to Peter until this moment. So we want God to lay out his miracles. We want God to lay out his plan. Here's the totality so we can agree to it. It's God's plan is not for you to agree to. He didn't ask James if he wanted to die, and he didn't ask Peter if he wanted to be delivered. The church is praying for that, but he didn't ask Peter, and he didn't share those things in advance. It just happened. Peter gets up. So Peter left the cell to follow the angel. And uh, But all the time, he thought it was a vision. In other words, he thought he was dreaming. Now, we know Peter has had visions before because that's how he knew to go uh, to the Roman captain's um, uh, quarters is is because he had had a vision when he was praying. So he just really thought that this was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually <laughs> happening. You know, again, he's in sort of a stupor here. Verse 10, they passed the first and second guard posts and came to the iron gates leading to the city. This opened all by itself. God is still, listen, you know, just the fact that he's getting past all those 12 folks, uh, you know, chains. I mean, Herod has made it impregnable uh, to, to get into. So how did the angel get there? God. And he, he has made it inescapable to get out of. So how, again, how did he get into How did he get out of it? God. And now even God is opening the gates of the city. God is opening every door for Peter. And I have found, guys, in our mission that this, this principle here is absolutely true. You don't have to open doors for yourself in the ministry. You don't have to drop hints or, or go after something. God's ministry is not like um, other positions uh, where you chase after, you know, I want to be, you know, I want to move up in the company. I want to do, I want to do, I want to do. Some people do do that, and I, you know, and that's between them and God. But what I have found works for me is that I just let God open the doors, and it's so crazy because He does. And then when God opens the door, it's a miracle, and there's no mistaking should I go through it or not. I mean, you know, Peter ain't gonna say, "Hey, I don't know if I need to go through that door or not." When God opens the door, it is it is evident that. God open that door to you. And that's that's very, very faith building. At least it has been um, for me. And so they passed through. So they passed through and started walking down the street. And suddenly the angel left him. And and <laughs> this would this would be uh, a moment where I say, hey, where'd my guard go? <laughs> you know, we hadn't made it to safety yet, God. I don't know if you know this. But this is how we second guess God in everything. You know, if it had been left up to me, I would have wanted the guard, the angel to just pick me up and carry me to where I'm going. Take me someplace far off where I can sit on an island and drink little drinks with umbrellas in it and prop my feet up. No, God isn't saving Peter for his comfort. God is saving Peter for God's service. And, and, and we, we don't often get that in the mission. We think that we're going to get to a day where we get to retire. We get to prop our feet up. But again... God's ministry is not like other ministry, not like other jobs. You don't retire. I don't. I don't get the opportunity to retire, nor would I ever want to. Now I may have to take a, a secondary role in that. I may not be the lead pastor always. I don't know what God has planned for me, but I plan on pastoring God's people until God calls me home, unless He tells me to do something different. And and here, we seem to 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 get that sense that. That uh, if it had been us, we'd say, hey, my guard's gone. Where'd he go? But but Peter, verse 11 says, finally comes to the sense it's really true. So it's up to this point until the angel disappears that Peter realizes, wait a minute, this is actually 
happening. The Lord has sent an angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. See, he lived under no delusion, church. He lived under no delusion. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. Now, John Mark has a rich history in, in the Bible. Um, and we're not going to go into that this morning because I, I don't want to get off on a rabbit. But um, if you ever have time, just kind of do a little study. It won't take you long, but it really is an interesting study on John Mark. And I think you'll probably see a lot of you in John Mark where they had gathered. But this is where they were holding the prayer meeting was at Mary's house, the, uh, the mother of John Mark. They had gathered. So he knocked on the gate. Now look, this is the first time that God did not open the door for him. I mean, he went, uh, he realized he went to the home of Mary. This was where they were holding the prayer meeting. I assume that this was sort of the hub um, for them. And we know that Jesus liked to be here. And we know that John Mark saw a lot of the things. That's how he wrote what he wrote. But, um, but anyway, um, notice that in this particular case, while God had opened all the other gates, this particular gate, God did not open. And there's no angel with Peter at all. So he knocks on the gate. And the servant girl named Rhoda, I think it's interesting that we know her name. Um, because a lot of times you have, I don't want to call her a secondary character, but you have people who really you don't see anywhere else. And, and it's just this person, or that person, or they, they're known by their title or whatever. But here's the servant girl, and we actually know her name. Her name is Rhoda. And so Rhoda came and opened it up. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed that instead, so overjoyed that instead of voting the gate, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter's standing at the door. She was so overjoyed. <laughs> Peter's got to be thinking, ah, oh, they're looking for me. What the heck are you doing? You know, annoyance would, would finally... Uh, come up, you know, aggravation, uh, you know, fear. But Peter's not living. In, and then here's the thing that I think Peter gets and the, the thing that we need to get. If God has delivered me this far supernaturally, he's got me. And again, if I get killed outside the gate of, of uh, Mary's house, then that would be the will of God. I'm just going to trust God. And isn't that weird? You know, that's just a level of faith that we all need to aspire to. She runs. She's so excited. She runs. She's overjoyed. And uh, she went and told everybody, Peter's standing at the door. This is what the, prayer, the holy people in the prayer service say. You're out of your mind. <laughs> it would have done better for Rhoda to have taken Peter with her, I think. But uh, that's my opinion. You're out of your mind. They said, when she insisted, they, they decided it must be his angel. Well, they're close. His angel had been with him. Not now. And, uh, but meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. So Peter's still, boop, boop, boop. <laughs> hello, anybody in there? When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. How many times have you, I, I'll give you an example that's in our church, but how many times do you look at, um, um, well, shoot, Miss Marie, and are amazed. We prayed for God to heal her. Her husband's faith just believed that God was going to heal her. And she sat in our midst now over a year, maybe two years, I lose track of time, healed Healed. I didn't see that happen with Brother James uh, Duke. Didn't see that happen with Wick Malloy. But I look at Marie amazed. You know, with Wick and with James, I have to conclude that the ministry that they had here on earth was complete. They had run the race. They had finished their course. And God had called them home. Marie's had not, and we earnestly played, prayed, but isn't it crazy how we lose the awe and wonder that God answered our prayer? And these people have been praying earnestly that Peter would be released, that Peter would be saved, and now he's standing at their door, and they're amazed. 
Buddy. <laughs> Buddy. Get up here. I'm sorry, guys. They are amazed. Wonderfully amazed. He mentioned for them to quiet down, and he told them that the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened. And he said, and then he went to another place. At dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers about what happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered and threw uh, and, uh, a thorough search for him. When he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated and sentenced them to death. After Herod left Judea, uh, Judea he stayed in Caesarea for a while. So Peter has gone to stay at another place now. Herod has found out. He's had the guards who were supposed to be guarding Peter killed. And now he skipped town because he knows this is trouble. He's left Judea and he's gone to Caesarea, his little, his little uh, escape. So I want to show you, you can run, but you can't hide from God. And this is why God says vengeance is his. In your ministry, starting back at the beginning, you don't look at other people. You stay focused on what God has for you. You don't always understand it. You won't always understand it. I'm going to share a scripture with you in just a little bit. You won't always understand it, but you got to trust God. God will open the doors that he wants opened for you. Some of them you're going to have to stand and knock by faith and wait as an answer to prayer, but God will open the doors you can't open. The, the door that, he, that God didn't open was a door that could be opened by someone of love, but the other doors couldn't be opened unless God opened them, and he did. And so now we see that Herod has skipped town. And, uh, and now we kind of shift gears for a minute, but I want to, uh, God, God does this for a purpose. Watch. Now, Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. It's, it's, it's like this isn't even part of the story, but this is, this is what happens. This is God's vengeance. So, so listen. So they sent a delegation to make peace with him because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food. The delegates won support of Blastus, Herod's personal assistant, and an appointment with Herod was granted. When the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robe, sat on his throne, and made a speech to them. So get the picture. Herod is self-important. Herod is not self-appointed, but he's not really the king. Uh, just because Rome says he is, he's not the king of God's people. But he's he's putting on the pomp. He's got all the thing. He's got the big house. He's got the big Camelot. He's got everything, and and uh, and so people are coming to grovel at his feet because they need not coming because they love him. They're coming because they need something from him, and so Herod sits, puts on all his majesty, and sits on the throne to make a speech. The people uh, make a speech and uh, made a speech to them. When Herod finished his speech, now we have no content of the speech. Um, but but look how the people reacted. The people gave him a great ovation, a great ovation. In other words, standing ovation, shouting, screaming. It is the voice of a god, not a man. It's the voice of a god, not a man. Do you see you see where they're elevating Herod to? It's the voice of a god. Instantly, instantly. Remember, we're talking about instance. James was killed in an instant. Peter was delivered. His deliverance came in an instant. God's vengeance comes in an instant. We don't know what the next moment holds. Instantly, an angel of the Lord struck Herod with the sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. And he was consumed with worms and died. I, 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 will, I tell you this. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread. So that's So you get this little snippet just to say, listen, trust God. He's got your enemies. He's got your friends. God knows just exactly when to strike and how to do it. You don't. Now listen, listen to this. Isaiah 55, uh, 8 and 9. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Guys, it's called faith. And I don't, I don't always understand it. Um, I don't always agree with it, to be honest with you. I don't, when I see something happen, I don't instantly say, oh, wow, praise God. Uh, if, it's, if it's something I perceive as bad, 
Now, I do eventually get around to that point, and I'm, I'm growing to the point that no matter what happens, like Peter, no matter what happens, but I, I'm not there yet, but I'm growing there. That's, that's my goal. In my mission, you always want to be growing in your faith and, and understanding that God's got the next instance. If it's, if it's death for you, God has it. It's in God's hand. If it's more ministry for you, if it's escape for you, God has it. It's in his hand. If it's vengeance for you, God has it. It's in his hand. It's in the next second. You just have to trust God. That's hard to do, my friends, because we've been so ingrained. At least I have. Maybe you have. I've been so ingrained to trust myself. Trust God. On your mission, always trust the next moment because whatever you need is just an instant away. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for this amazing scripture. Thank you for this wonderful word. And Lord, I just pray that we will take it now and use it. Amazing ways to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Look forward to seeing you again.